Uh, continuing with the next discussion, uh, the next uh, panel discussion topic is, uh, we have heard a lot about NEP 2020 today, and this is uh, how we uh, do align the technology requirements with how actually NEP 2020 will be deployed on the ground. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, uh, I would like to announce that we have uh, the felicitation and award ceremony today evening. So I would request all the assembled uh, delegates here uh, that we will be starting at 7.30 onwards. Uh, so that uh, they um, should, uh, we would request all of you to join us for the award ceremony uh, 7.30 p.m. onwards. So now, uh, let me introduce uh, the panelists for this session. Uh, let us welcome Amal Arora, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Shemrock and Shemford Group of Schools. Round of applause for Amal. Next, we have Amrita Barman, Deputy Director of Sunbeam Group of Schools, Varanasi. Round of applause for Amrita. We next have Anju Suni, Principal Shivnadar School, Noida. Round of applause for Anju. Uh, uh, our next panelist uh, uh, is Dr. Parin Somani. Uh, she is an independent academic scholar. Uh, can we have Dr. Parin on stage? We next have Srinivasan Sriram, Principal of the Man School, Delhi. Can we have Sriram on stage? Next, we would like to welcome Harshit Bansar, Director of Abhinav Group of Schools. Can we have uh, Harshit? Uh, we have with us Somitra Singh Thakur, Principal of the Creek Planet School, uh, Venus Campus in Hyderabad. And uh, if uh, Anju Soni, Principal, Shivnada School, uh, yeah. A round of applause for Anju Soni. And to moderate the discussion, may I welcome Kanak Gupta, Director of Set MR Jaipuria Schools. Uh, thank you, Rajni Ji. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. We're coming to the fag end of the conference, and it's my absolute honor, privilege to moderate uh, this discussion. Uh, I have the simplest and the most interesting job today uh, to ask relevant questions to these uh, illuminaries who are sitting uh, on the stage. And I look forward to learning a lot. Uh, to give you an idea as to how seriously I have taken this panel discussion, I have notes over here as well, which generally most of us don't do uh, ever since the, the, the pandemic struck and we've all become used to panel discussions. Right. Uh, you know, very interesting times for all of us. Uh, the new education policy uh, saw the light of day, I think, uh, you know, 34, 35 years. But uh, we are all very excited about it. We are very excited about it because it's a very aspirational document. Uh, we are still waiting for the implementation plan, but uh, we are very excited about uh, that the implementation is going to help us uh, uh, in many ways or not. We'll find out from our panelists today. Uh, the NEP, I strongly believe, is the starting point of reforms. It's not the end point of reforms. And there's a lot that the NEP aspires for, but that does not necessarily mean that that's the end all and be all of everything that we say and we do. Uh, I strongly believe that, for example, NEP has mandate for uh, uh, professional development of uh, our educators. Well, you know, as an educator, I strongly believe you should invest in professional development of everyone who is associated with you. I think that's very, very important. Uh, the NEP talks a lot about technology. And, you know, the, since uh, March 2020, we've all been very accustomed to using technology in a big way as well. Uh, and we are going through a transition period as well, where we're talking about the real world applications, flip learning and whatnot. So uh, very, very exciting times for us as educators. Uh, I thought I'd just set the context and then I'd throw open the questions 
to the panel. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Amolji. Uh, uh, Amol Arora, Vice Chairman of Shemford Schools. So Amolji, considering the pace with which technology is now changing, we all are trying to become predictive of as to what the next, uh, what's next in the education fraternity coming up. And we're talking about how do we engage children better? How do we empower children better? And how do we provide experience using hybrid models? Your thoughts on that, Amolji? Yes, uh, thank you, Kadaka. I think, uh, as you rightly said, two things really became the tipping point. One was NEP and, of course, the COVID situation, which forced everyone to uh, adapt tech in education, where edtech was always like the perennial bridesmaid. The next best thing to happen, it never actually had nothing really changed. So I think uh, what is uh, next is something that's not something I'm thinking about. Right now, we're all thinking about what now? Because we've, got a, we've had two years of a different ex teaching learning experience, and how do I adapt it to today's classroom, where there's somewhat a backlash against tech as well. We've had enough. There's a lot of uh, learnings which skill sets have been developed because those have to be integrated now and that's the challenge. We can't go back to doing things the way they were. So right now I think a lot of experimentation and every school is going to find their own balance of in-person versus technology. How do you enable more teachers? How do you ensure uh, self-paced learning? And of course we know that going forward uh, tech will have a more and more role but I think one thing that has been clarified in COVID is technology alone is not going to make it, you know, where edtech companies used to pay that this is it, you just give the children a content, put them in a box and after 12 years you open the box and suddenly it should be a transformed child. So technology is going to be an enabler of, for teachers, it's going to be an enabler for children to develop their self-learning paths, what will be through uh, AI powered assessments, curated content. So I think it's going to be a lot of experimentation for us and what is the good thing has happened is with COVID, we are all teachers are now okay to experiment and we are all okay and parents are also okay to. Otherwise, before COVID, everything was in a status quo. Nobody wanted to change. Marks are not going to be able to change. You know, so that was a kind of thought. So I think this is going to be very, it's going to be very dynamic and a lot of experimentation is going to happen and 5G is going to accelerate the IoT kind of thing. So what kind of data are we picking up for our children? How do we use that data to assess where the child's ideal happy life should be, not just the career? So it's going to be exciting time and I think a lot of innovation is going to come from the edtech side of things now and I think that's where I'm looking forward to looking at what's out there and see what can we incorporate in our schools. Superb. I've noted down uh, and I love that uh, that phrase, edtech has been the perennial bridesmaid. I think I, I love that phrase that you said. But you, I'm glad that you're talking about uh, the now as well because there's so much that we need to do and uh, uh, experimentation, yes, it's happening and I'd like to come back to you later in, and I would pick your brains about as to how you are dealing with uh, uh, the pre-K segment as well because you run such a large change. I'm going to go to Dr. Amrita Berman next. Uh, Amrita ji, uh, we talk in India with a digital divide. You know, whether we like Mr. Amani or not, we talk about, you know, the networking has become easier uh, in most places. But we talk about the digital divide in the country. You and I work in tier 2, tier 3 cities. Uh, do you see that digital divide? Because the NEP is very aspirational in terms of being a more like an India, not just for 2030, but 2040. Uh, your thoughts on that, ma'am? So, um, first of all, good evening. And I'm so glad to be here. And I want to thank APEC for making this possible. I was here for two panel discussions. And I thought they were really brilliant with their thoughts. Uh, coming to the digital divide, I think uh, the digital divide was possibly one of the biggest problems we had and we saw right in the face when it came to the COVID situation. Because though most of the progressive schools like us were talking really big, there was an emergency response to the problem we had, but we still could manage to look at a lot of solutions at the end of the day, because we did have children coming from more privileged backgrounds. We did come, you know, come from tier two, tier three towns. Nevertheless, there were a number of children who managed, you know, to get their devices, get the internet. So things were better, but there were many, many, many children who couldn't make it at all. And, you know, just to give you a very small example, when things became just slightly better, when we could do something, 
we as schools from slightly more privileged backgrounds did manage to get a few devices together, for example, to give it to children. We really couldn't do much about the internet, but we could at least try and get the devices in the hands. Or we had a set of our teachers trying to go and train, uh, you know, teachers from schools which were totally for the underprivileged and try to do something for them. But what I see coming, since it's very much a part of the NEP, and NEP actually from the first um, part that they took out when we were still discussing the format of the NEP to what finally came up during the COVID, I don't know whether most of you all noticed that there was a chapter specifically added on online teaching, which was not there in the previous format, it came up. Which also means that there's a huge intent that the government has on bringing technology to education. So if you have an intent of getting technology to education, then internet has to be cheap, has to be available. Training on technology for the government school teachers, for, teach, for teachers from the lower budget schools, uh, private budget schools, is extremely important. Because of, you know, for progressive schools like ours, Teacher training is nothing new, frankly. It was just mandated as a 50 hour, and we were probably doing even more, and even today we do more. So the digital divide is there. But I see the intent and the potential to bridge this divide. And I'm very hopeful about it, very, very optimistic. Fantastic, I'm so happy to. So agility of your system, uh, ma'am, I've taken away from what you've said, uh, uh, because yes, the teachers did react, and all of us as educators strongly believe that teachers reacted in a very, very positive manner. Uh, I'm so glad to, I've, I've noted down a couple of more points, uh, uh, training of teachers being a hygiene factor, and which has always been there, and I'd love to pick your brains more on it, because you also talked about training on technology, which is something most people assume that it's just about training of using a hardware device, which it is beyond that. I think I'll, I'll pick your brains on pedagogy as well, ma'am. Uh, I'm going to go to Anju Soniji. Ma'am, uh, while uh, Dr. Berman faces uh, a, a, you know, a challenge with the digital divide and you know, the device uh, access of many students, uh, your parents would be slightly more privileged, I'd like to believe, at Shiv Nadar School in Noida. Uh, and your parents would not have that problem of device and internet uh, access availability. Probably way too many devices for one child to handle. Uh, how do you bring about that precision in education at your school? Do you want to share some best, best practices keeping in mind that, uh, uh, yes, the last two years have been tough, but the coming years are going to be more challenging because this is the generation that probably did not experience the classroom education the way uh, ever before. Ma'am, your thoughts? Thank you, Kanak. Um, good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Okay. Uh, so, the question um, about the digital, digital divide is not just prevalent for a particular school or a group of schools. I think the country we belong to, digital divide, is a issue that is faced by every school. Uh, doesn't really matter how privileged or less privileged school you might be. Uh, so that's a reality that's facing all of us and we must acknowledge that. Of course it came to the forefront with the pandemic. Uh, at Shivnadu School and thanks to our policy makers, I think the RTE Act that came in 2009 makes sure that we try and bridge the digital divide. Having said that, um, at Shivnada School, we've had a similar experience about the digital divide with a lot of neighborhood children coming into the school. Uh, it was important for us to act fast, make sure that there were these devices that were uh, provided to the children. And I must officially go on record and express gratitude not just to the senior leadership at our school, but also to the parent pool that we have, the parent community, who came together as one community and ensured that every child has a digital device or a data connection, whether it was in the form of uh, those little, uh, I'm forgetting the name right now. Yeah, thank you so much, dongles. Um, uh, so that's the digital divide. 
uh, sharing of best practices, to be very honest, uh, we have to be very, very cognizant of the fact that the generation that we are dealing with is the generation that has been born into a very, very fast-paced world, into a world of technology. Dealing with technology, technology is no stranger to them. What is important is how we tame this beast that we call technology in a structured school system. And for that, what is important is breaking down the silos of the subjects that we are living in, interdisciplinary projects, different pathways, because we must recognize that every student, every learner is different and has a different way to learn. So when I say different pathways, there are visual learners, there are learners who learn better by audio inputs, there are learners who learn better by doing things. So I think it has to be an amalgamation of all this. And uh, to be very honest, we started on this journey, I think about a year before the pandemic happened, and uh, where we did introduce something known as the one is to one program, where our middle schoolers had the opportunity to use iPads during school hours for their learning, for their projects, which of course takes me back to the same thing that uh, Dr. Berman said, uh, professional development of the teachers. Also, this was a model which held us in good stead when the pandemic struck the world. Because the children were already used to working on technology, were used to working in groups, were used to collaborate irrespective of the presence of the teacher. So it became a personalized learning pathway for every student to learn at his or her own pace, which led to something uh, we call the personal projects at Shivnada School, where each child dived into more into their area of interest, giving spark to their curiosity and the cycle of inquiry. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Super, ma'am. You talked about uh, uh, parents as true partners in, at, at, at your school, which is uh, something that we all believe in. And I'm not trying to steal from a tech company which advertises that, but uh, genuinely the, the, the educators who've been trying to uh, work with parents, I think that's uh, something very important. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to come to uh, Dr. Shiram. Uh, sir, at your school, you have uh, the, uh, the, the education journey of every student at the Man School mapped. You also have artificial intelligence, if I remember reading your website correctly. Uh, do you want to share some, some light? Because the NEP talks a lot about AI, and they talk a lot about ambient intelligence. How are you doing this at your school at this time? And how do you foresee doing it better in the future, sir? Uh, thank you, Apex, for having me here. Uh, well, to be frank with you, uh, we started off with uh, a lot of initiatives uh, in that arena of having AI as uh, a leading medium to take the students through, but uh, it got stalled due to the pandemic and we couldn't do much. In fact, uh, you know, my school is situated on the outskirts of Delhi and uh, students that come to my school are largely from uh, the nearby villages. So the digital divide that you've already spoken of was something which was very evident in my school as well. Uh, during the pandemic, I had to address that concern uh, as my first priority. And hence, uh, I was trying to get a platform which can be used by the students, not by spending a great amount of money, but even it is available on a normal mobile phone. Okay, that was my priority. And uh, it paid to a large extent in terms of getting the students to attend the classes. So that itself was a big success to me, uh, keeping in mind the kind of digital divide we had in other parts of the country, where even to get the students to uh, be a part of the online lesson was a challenge. But going forward, as you rightly said, NEP talks about AI in a big way, and uh, we are in the process of doing that as a part of our own ERP, wherein there is going to be a lot of data points that are going to be taken from each and every activity, what the students are going to do as a part of their regular schedule, and then map them 
with AI playing a role in getting us that data as to where do we really require to concentrate or address the concerns of students. Yes, it is in the pipeline, but to be frank, we have not implemented it yet. Uh, I'm glad you spoke about uh, uh, the future and as you know, how AI can map uh, the learning in the classroom because quite frankly, our students are getting ready for jobs that have not been invented yet. We don't know what the future holds and probably we'll have a more entrepreneurial India is what uh, uh, all of us are looking and uh, thank you so much for sharing that uh, Dr. Sri Ram. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Parin Samani. Uh, uh, Dr. Subhani, uh, Dr. Shiram spoke about analytics, but uh, uh, I'm, and I'm going to play the devil's advocate. Uh, educators are not analytic, uh, analysts. Uh, educators do not understand num numbers. Uh, as a teacher, why should I look at numbers and why should I look at trends and analysis that Dr. Shiram is talking about? Your thoughts, ma'am. First of all, I would like to say a very big thank you to APEC for inviting me here. Um, Akashji and Subhanji and all the audience on the line and off the line that this conference of the Global Education Skill Conquer will give a lot of um, support, a lot of help to the people who really would love to know about what we are talking here. Um, going back to the, of the digital device and how, why are we, how come we are that analytic or we are not analytic my mark of a word, not, and yes, we are. As a teacher, as an educator, while well, I'm in this field from last 35 years, so I can tell you with the confidence and all my supreme, all my educators and my uh, supervisors and big guys are here, I can, you all will agree that education is vital in each and everyone's life. To be a very thorough analytic, yes, we have to be as an educator. But wherever we need to do the work, which is more important. So when we talk about the digitalization, I think this pandemic has given a big change in our life. Number one, we, we always knew this digital thing but we were not into this digital thing the way we should be. But yes, this pandemic has given us a lesson to learn that in the remote, in a small villages also, we managed to give a education to our students in a very small scale. So think about it, that the village, the, they did not have a television. Just start with the basic thing that everybody has a television in the city. But in the small villages, they did not have it. I'm just going out of the topic just to make it more uh, understand our audience that even in this pandemic, though the television was so important part, but people did not have internet. People did not have a good connection. But COVID has given us that opportunity to get connected to each and everyone. Think about our grandparents. They did not know how to do the video conferencing call. But yes, they learned because they could not see the grandchildren. They could not, the grandchildren or family couldn't see them. So that was the opportunity for each and every soul in this world had the chance to be educated and to understand the new world in the technology field. In this world, we have faced all the challenges. The world is upside down. But how can we bring it together, which is very important? Yes, we are talking about all the different things. Yes, that is important. But this world is already been changed. And now we are the future. How can we bring this world together? I would like to leave the three messages. Number one. We need to believe in ourselves. When we believe in ourselves, the world will believe us. As an educator, everybody who are sitting down here, we are in the field where we can bring our generation, a new, new person. We can flourish them. Number two, be the word you say, be authentic, be ethical. Don't make false promises. If you can do it, 
then just say yes you can do it so be ethical because we are the role model for our children and number 3 build the bridges between society between the people around us between the global world and yes by having that thing in our mind we can bring all the answers which are going to be answered which is very important but these three key messages will help each and every one to bring it together thank you superb so yes please please ma'am yes ma'am please go ahead uh, please feel free to jump in all of you like you know we can have an absolute no, fire side chat i won't have this to it them are yet to speak but i'll just make it you see that question of yours that educate educators have nothing to do with numbers i think is something that we all need to get up and say no it's not true and i think possibly because i'm just taking from what mr shrinivasan also said when he spoke about ai because i know that he's brilliant with technology i've had my experience with him i think the way ai and analytics came up during the pandemic it was already there even i wouldn't know the power of it but i think each one of us educators came to see the numbers came to see the brilliance of artificial intelligence and the way data was coming up the way the assessments were being done the way the gaps were coming up and the way personalized training came up it made us all stand up and say data numbers matter because they immediately told us where we need to do our thing our stuff better where we need to learn better where we need to change the way we teach our children over to you i would completely endorse that because i think the numbers the data everything that came out uh, during the pandemic is what actually led us to personalize the learning and allow the learner to learn the way the learner would learn the best because i think the end goal of education is to help the learner learn and it also helps us as educators because it helps me plan better as an educator it helps me make the necessary interventions at the right time to be able to make a success of my uh, learners learning journey so i think data analytics is a very important and a key component of education thank you uh, well can i can i add on to that i'm Please sorry gentlemen uh, i i purposely threw this bait i knew that all of you would take this <laughs> bait because it's so close to all of us right no but i can't uh, but agree with uh, these two beautiful ladies here in what they said uh, the beauty of the whole thing is that the teachers do not have to, or the the management does not have to do to remember anything regarding analytics that's the beauty they just have to go through their processes on a daily basis it is the system that throws you all the information that you require so that is the beauty of the system that we have built in and uh, you have to see it to believe it and i request the panelists and the members here if it is possible do make a visit to our school and i can demonstrate it to you uh, you know the the, the fact sir i am going to take you up on that offer first before anyone else grabs the opportunity i have been wanting to visit the man school for a very long time i'll be coming to your school very soon most welcome but uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen it's a very important aspect to all educators and you can see as to how passionate everyone is about analytics like you know uh, in god we trust everyone else should bring numbers i think that's something that uh, uh, has been said and i think analytics is something uh, that will drive forward trends in education that will be uh predictive uh, uh for all of us to understand as to what we need to be doing uh, at our schools and uh, using our tech platforms uh thank you so much uh, for jumping in i think that was important as well and i'm glad that uh, i asked this question uh i'm going to go quickly to uh, somitra singh thakur ji uh so you run a school in hyderabad and um, there's a lot of talk about uh, education in 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 the mother tongue uh in the nep and there has been a lot of discussion about as to whether it's right it's wrong there's a lot of debate all over and we've all been part of that discussion and the audience as well now can technology somehow bridge that gap that is there with regards to the mother tongue problem that a lot of educators and parents are foreseeing your thoughts sir thank you kanak uh, good evening to all and thank you to apac for giving me uh, this opportunity to speak here in this panel the question is very apt in terms of nep when we talk about regional language 
Yes, up to primary NEP is talking about regional language education. Being uh, in South is my first experience in my 23 years of career in education. I faced a lot of challenges working with this uh, Telugu language. But what I found is that being mother tongue, if education comes up to primary in mother tongue, it gives a lot of insight. The conceptual understanding which comes is really commendable. Now how technology can help us? Technology can help us a lot. We all very well aware about translator of Google. All the languages are available. We can translate it in uh, any kind of language. So let children learn into their mother tongue in a school and let technology help them. As Sridham Shah is talking about AI implementation, so the augmented reality can convert the language from mother tongue to uh, global language. So this mother tongue to global translation and then reteaching through augmented reality, same concept to the children will help them a lot. So in my opinion, technology can play a vital role in translation and giving education into regional language up to primary. I am not talking about above primary, but yes, up to grade 5, this is going to be a very uh, game changer in terms of education industry. Thank you. Great. So, we do feel that, you know, the regional languages can come into uh, the mainstream as well, which is something uh, we all look forward to. Great. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Yes. I'll come back to you with more questions. I'm going to go quickly to Harshit ji. Uh, Harshit uh, Bansal ji runs uh, uh, schools and preschools. Uh, preschools are finally part of uh, the new education policy, uh, Harshit ji. And the thing uh, what I wanted to pick your brain about. Now, the last two years has seen uh, students, children not going to schools. Uh, you would have seen 3K students studying at home with their parents or grandparents, family members, etc. But one problem has emerged, uh, Harshiji, where these students who were in probably uh, lower KG or upper KG and when they are coming to main school now, they have online friends. They don't have real world friends. They don't have social skills that uh, kids of that age would probably have. And, you know, it's an irreversible travesty probably if we don't give the kids social skills. Uh, are you facing this problem? And what do you think is the solution for this? <clears throat> uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to APAC for having us all at this beautiful panel over here. I was already planning on uh, presenting the against the motion part of the technology because all of my uh, fellow panelists have gone for, for the motion uh, for the technology. But I always believe that while we are talking uh, about technology, technology has been the talk of the town since the past two years. COVID and NEP both have been amalgamated together and they have discussed about technology a lot. But we need to discuss how much is too much. And coming back to again to your question that yes, not only us, but everyone is now feeling that divide, that gap. The child that was in upper KG is now entered grade 3 after two years of lockdown and COVID. He doesn't have any friends. He doesn't have any social responsibilities. He doesn't know how to interact with the children of his own class. Leave aside the children, he is not able, comfortable to talk to his own teacher in the class. So until and unless there, that interaction is there, how is he going to express and how is he going to take what is being expressed? So while we are on the topic of talking, kya hume amalgamate karna hai system mein, we should also talk side by side, kitna hume amalgamate karna hai. NEP also talks about the integration of technology since uh, from grade 6 onwards. So, policy makers do understand till grade 5 it is not that much required. Yes, always technology, there are two parts in the school system. One is for the teacher, one is for the student. For teachers, yes, I sh surely believe that teachers should be exposed to technology a lot, the data analytics and the other parts as well. But for the student, I strongly believe that till grade 5, we should and limit the exposure of technology for the child. That those 8-10 years are there for his social uh, development skills, emotional development skills, so that he can interact with his peers, learn, grow and you know, be the best of his own version. So that's what I believe in that area. Thank you. With everyone's permission, especially yours, Kanak, may I just add to what... So, uh, 
I completely resonate with what you're saying. Because the fact is, we are all focusing on the technology bit that the NAP offers. And I think what we are forgetting, um, I don't know if that's the right word, but I feel what we are forgetting is that the pandemic has brought along with it a lot of social, emotional, psychological gaps also. Yes. So while we are educators, and um, by definition, if our primary job is to focus on education, I think it's equally important for us to focus on the social, emotional well-being of our children. And uh, yes, there have been gaps observed, as correctly pointed out, where children have forgotten values of sharing, caring, um, how to interact socially with friends. But um, with this, what I would like to share is that with a very, very conscious and a very, very informed decision as educators, we decided this year at Shivnada School that when we begin the session in April, we are not doing a plunge into academics. We are going to focus on the social, emotional well-being of our students and our teachers. Let's not forget, teachers have also had a difficult time in the last two years. So uh, with this thought, we introduced something what is called the Launchpad program, uh, which was basically giving exposure to the things that the children had forgotten or the things that the children had not been exposed to. As correctly pointed out, students who onboarded started their school journey during the pandemic in nursery, today are in grade one, right? Uh, grade one, grade two, depending on lower kg, upper kg, etc. So uh, I think that is very important for us to remember that our primary job is not just to actually teach. Our job is also to be the change makers that we are discussing here today. So we must take that risk and look at what is important and what is the need of the R. And hence, the personalized learning that we spoke about a while ago. Thank you. Okay. Catalyst of change. I can see that everyone wants to chime in on this point. Harsha ji, you sparked. Uh, Ma'am, do you want to go for some? So I think I, uh, I completely agree with uh, both of them. And you know, somebody just mentioned in one of the panels, and I just love that. And I thought I'll just resonate the same thought. It's all about where technology and education meets. And I think that's the very, very important point that we have to, uh, you know, look into. But I just wanted to mention this. Um, as you mentioned, we both pretty much are in the same town. And coming from a place like Varanasi where, you know, for some reason or the other, either there's a prime minister's visit, visit which he just had about four days back, schools keep closing down. And that has really in the past impacted the way we manage to, you know, connect with our students and curriculum, etc. There are certain things in academics which are important because we don't want to just rush. You need to give time. You, you know, I think we all know it, so I don't want to get on to, with that. But what I was coming to is, even with the little ones, during the pandemic, when there was an emergency response because there was no other way, and sometimes in the course of the year, we have to connect on an online, as much as I hate to do it, we just have to do it even with the uh, primary children. So I think where we, uh, when we started, it didn't work too well. But it works well today when we do intermittently have to connect with the students of the uh, primary section. It has all got to do with how much you have researched on the way you connect to uh, the little ones. If you really manage the time, number one, you can't just go on forever with them. It doesn't work. Do you manage to give them the right kind of educational tools that you need to use to really engage your students? It's all about engagement. And online can be both synchronous and asynchronous. Now, how, how well are you marrying both? So I don't really say that it's the worst thing that you can do. Actually, it's not true. It's the way you really train your staff, the way you really train the teachers, which I think is really happening beautifully at a lot of schools, that it is also successful. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. And one thing that I missed mentioning earlier is, uh, I think Dr. Berman touched upon that, it's not about technology, whether we should have it or we should not have it, I think we need to remember that the generation that we are dealing with is way, way ahead of technology by birth. You and I can't match it, 
and let's not attempt doing that. It's about how do we manage, how do we tame the beast called technology. So technology should be an enabler. And I think in the previous um, panel discussion just before ours, uh, uh, one of the speakers said that building the student voice and choice is very, very important. So I think what technology has done for us as educators is we need to recognize the fact that we are co-creator of the learning journey. And we are just the facilitator and not the one who knows everything. So thank you. You know, uh, taking one step forward from what uh, Madam so said. Bef before you chime in, I'm just going to add one more point. I'm going to make it more complicated for you. Aajkal ke bache nalayak hain. Google से सब पूछ लेते हैं, Alexa से बात करते हैं और हमारे जमाने में हम library जाते थे, 18 घंटे research करते थे। uh, Where does that also come in with regards to the social skills, uh, research capabilities, etc. for students, sir? Uh, well, first I'd like to say this point and then I'll answer this question of yours. Uh, NEP, if you read the fine print, it makes the point very clear. It does not give center stage to technology. It gives center stage to pedagogy, and that is what Madam said, said that it is the way you need to do. If you will give too much of power to technology, I think it answers your question, uh, Kanak. It will be, it will, you know, finish off everything. So, bache nalaik hai, bilkul nahi hai. Hame bachon ko ek sahi rasta dikana hai. Ah, tabi. I let him finish and then I go to add. So, uh, all I want to say is, yeah, but, you know, we need to ensure that technology does not take over pedagogy. It should be pedagogy that controls technology. Uh, NEP is very clear about it. And I think as long as we ensure this happens, I don't think there will be, I mean, technology can only be an enabler and integrator and cannot be the decisive factor in education. So I just wanted to add that bache na like nahi hote. It is the kind of question that you put across to the students, which is not up to the mark. I don't want to use that word anymore. So if I can easily find something on Google, which is just at a remember level, well, we all need that kind of information. It's just information. But if it's something that they can just find and solve it, and that's the end without thinking, well, then something is wrong with the way you put things across. Because people are expected to research at a much higher level, and so are our children. So do I know what's the kind of question I need to put across to the child that he can't really find it on Google? He has to think. Application, real world uh, can I, problems. Can I add one I, I just want to add. Super. Okay. <laughs> I want to add, like, uh, see, when we are talking about technology, you're talking about Google, they can ask anything, any question. A child can ask a question related to medical field also. And Alexa is answering. But are they able to comprehend? Are they able to understand? Are they able to interpret? Here comes the role of pedagogy which sir is talking. So when we talk about NEP, the pedagogy should be able to make them understand what they need to understand, what they need to interpret, what they need to comprehend. And then they will use it in their practical life. So, what we are doing, are we looking to go back before pandemic? That's an impossible situation. So, when we talk about technology implementation into primary or these social skills and everything, we are looking for moving forward. So, now about this millennial generation who took birth after 2010, what will be their future? We all in our 40s and 50s, talking about a generation who is going to make their career after 10, 15 years. So when sir started and mentioned that we don't know what is going to happen in future, actually we don't know. So when we are talking that whether to implement technology in primary or no, we can't say. We just sir, have to facilitate. Sir, there's there's a young, young boy in his 30s who wants to chime in with something <laughs> right now. Right that's why, right he, next that's to why he moved back. <laughs> Please. I was just trying to exclude yeah. myself from this. Yeah, yeah. Please. Answer, please. And uh, adding to uh, these, uh, Kanak, your struggle of 18 hours at the library, you did not have any distractions over there. The struggle the child now has is far much more than what you had. Right. The environment you were in, you, it was a coercive environment of studying. You look around, you will you will only see students studying over there. But nowadays, if you are researching over Google, the child is researching over Google, he has ample number of distractions present over there. At just a click of a button. So, the struggle, he has much more than what we had at our times. Sure. Ma'am, you wanted to come in. I want to say 
But uh, because we are living in a technology world, this is the technology era for us. If we don't encourage our future generation to be in an advanced training, in an advanced research, then how are we going to bring them up? How can we flourish them? We want, instead of going on a negative side, I would say, yes, our future generation are more advanced than what we are. Curiosity is something we need to create in our students. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think we should, we should encourage them to be more, and I do like the point that yes, they have more challenges, because when they click off a button, there are different websites, and they are not able to concentrate what they want to achieve. Sure. They have to achieve what they are looking to do, but because the destruction is a lot, we did not sure. have that. So they have got that disadvantage. Um, Amolji, I'd like you to come in. Uh, we were talking about uh, the social skills of children and we're talking about technology and you know the divide etc uh, it'll be sacrilege if we don't share experiences from from your large network of uh, schools and preschools yeah as i said i think everyone's uh, there's a role for technology and i think we all are going on that it's not the be all and replacement and we've seen what has happened to some of the tech companies who are trying to raise capital now suddenly that whole thing has come crashing down and it was always there. So it's like a tool. I mean, no one's question, should we have books or should we have classrooms? No, class books are a part of it. So tech is a part of it. Let's, let's keep it at that road. Yes, there's a lot of innovation happening. There's no innovation happening in books apart from maybe QR codes or some, but there's a lot of work happening there. So that's what makes it exciting. In terms of social skills, I think children are much more resilient than we, we think they are. Yes, there was an initial shock when they came, when they would see the teacher's face, they would be stunned because they've always seen it in a, in a Zoom dabba, and suddenly they're seeing the person come alive in front of them. Uh, so I think that was, that they actually were, came across that barrier very quickly. So there were extreme cases where children used to cry when coming to school, and uh, now they were crying when parents are coming to pick them up. They don't want to go home. So there was a lot of e extreme reactions, but very quickly everyone settled down. There were those cases where kids are not used to sitting down in a place for uh, many, many hours and like that. So I think kids are much more resilient, but it's the language policy also, I think for children to pick up a language and it's much easier for them. And the, the challenge that we have is, we all talking about this is, we are in a different generation. We are almost a different species and we're making rules for them. We're a different species altogether for them. As Harshad mentioned, it's, it is challenging. I mean, those companies have professionals whose job is to hook those kids. Look at the challenge they're facing, man. Every company wants stickiness on their apps, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or Insta or whatever. And uh, it is a big challenge for them, but they're very resilient. And the fact that this resilience is something that we need to build upon is something that we adults are facing the challenge. Why do we talk about, kids are not talking about these things. We are talking about them, we are brainstorming them. For them, it's natural, I think. So I think... Uh, uh, the social skills, yes, they missed out, we all know that, but they'll be back in normal in no time. I, 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 I would give them Kid, credit for that. Kids are more resilient. I think the best part about this is when we talk about the social skills is the value for a, a social being, for being a social being, for interaction, for the fact that I was missing, I think has really gone up. When they were not in touch with people, fine, they were all locked up. But the moment they came to school, they realized that this is what I was missing. So I think the value of the fact that we need to be in touch with people, that human touch, that physical touch, I think the value of that has gone up tremendously. I think minute I entered this conference and instead of seeing the whole team on Dabbas with the APAC, had last two years had so many Zoom sessions, I mean, seeing people physically is, is, is just a nice experience. I'm happy to them. Anybody's inviting me to conference, I'm like, so happy to see people. That's it. I think it's not just kids. I mean, we're also very happy. So, so Amulji, in the last uh, two weeks, I've attended three conferences and everyone started telling me now, sir, you're sitting here, that's why you're coming here. But uh, the, the organizers have very kindly slipped us a note, uh, you know, that uh, we need to conclude the session and there are other panelists who are waiting and I respect uh, the fact. Thank you so much for switching on the ventilation. I was melting on stage a little while ago, but uh, I think this has been a great discussion. Uh, we talked a lot about as to how technology is impacting uh, the education processes and we all as educators feel that uh, uh, the points that I've gathered from here is that let children be, uh, let educators uh, get access to more development opportunities, don't just look at it as a technology divide but as a pedagogical intervention uh, that is required. Look at, at parents as true partners in the teaching learning process. Uh, 
we had an industrial revolution we had uh, a, te a technology revolution and you know we we are seeing a sort of social revolution where there is more analytics required there is more understanding and empathy required and i think uh, uh, empathy uh, engagement and providing good experience would be the three pillars on which our education system would probably go forward uh, in the future i'm so glad uh, to have accepted this invitation from apac thank you so much for having us all over here and uh, uh, i look forward to carrying forward the conversation offline with all my co panelists who've been absolutely brilliant uh, and i think uh, we touched a nerve and everyone got excited and i'm so happy that this has been one of the most interactive panel discussions i have had the honor and privilege of moderating thank you so much ladies and gentlemen thank you so much kanak on a closing note you felt hot not because of lack of ventilation but the discussion was hot <laughs> <laughs> the discussion was very hot absolutely the heated discussion and i'm so glad that we did this thank you so much apac for inviting us and god bless have a great evening ladies and gentlemen Thank you uh, so much, uh, Kanak Gupta, Director of Saint Emma J. P. Schools, for wonderfully playing the role of moderator. And I would like to thank Mr. Amul Arora, Amul Tabarman, Anju Soni, Dr. Parin Somani, Srinivasan Sriram, Harshit Bansar, and Shamitra Singh Thakur for uh, accepting our invite to be a part of this panel discussion. And thank you so much. Yes, uh, future is bright. It up, it's up to us, to parents, to make children's future brighter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.